What I'd like to do is talk about uh, it, the theme of the conference, sharing resources uh, uh, in a changing world, and use the, what we call the mountains, the Hindu Kush Himalaya, as a backdrop. Share with you some vignettes and some, some uh, stories about mountains. The uh, Hindu Kush Himalayan region stretches from Afghanistan to Myanmar and includes uh, India, China, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, as well as Pakistan. But we recognize that the mountain area also serves downstream people. So while we have 200 million people in the mountains, about 1.3 billion people live downstream and depend on mountain resources. So if we also think about the food produced from that water, it's about 3 billion people who are somehow dependent uh, on mountain people. So it's an important resource base. This is a map of population density. And so if you look just outside of the mountain regions, you see that those are places where there are very dense uh, population belts. It's also one of the most irrigated places in the world on the plains downstream. But one of the things we find about mountains is that often decisions that affect mountains are made somewhere else, in Beijing or in Delhi. An example is hydropower development, right? The, the region is thirsty for energy, and the mountains are the obvious place for hydropower, so the capitals decide to put hydropower there. The mountain sentiment is you're using our resources but you're not giving us back the benefits, right? You're destroying our environment, yet we don't get the gains from those benefits. And so there's a lot of tension over sharing benefits over these resource bases. So who are the mountain people? An incredibly diverse uh, set of people, about 600 living languages in that region, but also a diversity as far as the solutions uh, in adapting to different climatic situations is there certainly many solutions as we're looking forward in the future. It's also a place of incredible genetic diversity as well, and we heard the talk from bioversity, but hidden in those valleys are, are a lot of uh, uh, genes for crops uh, for the future. We work with an organization, Erica, to, to uh, celebrate that diversity in mountain areas. And certainly a lot, of, uh, a lot of different farming systems. Now in mountains, when we're talking about food security and nutrition, it's not really that carbohydrate security that was mentioned. It's really high-valued crops and getting those to, to the market and using that money to perhaps buy food, nutritious food, that will meet our food security needs into the future. Now, this photo was taken in the late 1980s, and it's actually inspired me to get into water resources. And what we see is a farmer-managed irrigation system in Nepal. And there, they have an idea of equity, right? If I own one hectare of land, you own two hectares, you should get twice as much water as I do. You should also do twice as much maintenance. So there's very strong institutional, very strong communities managing the system. What they do is they have developed a technology to reinforce those rules. So this Sancho or key, the width of that is dependent on the shares in that system. So they have a way, an institution, that reinforces their ideas of equity. Now the marvelous thing too about this is there was a researcher coming in and putting a way to measure that water and see if that really principle of equity was holding in that case. I could see myself in that picture doing research, can't you? Now one thing about that is you see it's all men, right? That was, so I was in Nepal 1991 to 95 working with these farmer managed irrigation systems. Now I came back 30 years later. What happened? You go to the village and it's all women, right? Not every village, but, but it's like you're dealing with women communities. What's happened is quite a transformation. Men are migrating. They're migrating to cities for jobs. They're migrating to the Middle East for jobs, right? They're migrating because of climate change. Women are there taking care of the resource. But that's a marvelous opportunity, too. It's uh, working with these organized groups of women to build resilience to change is quite an incredible opportunity and some, a change that is happening. 
So when we're looking to the future, we recognize that there are many, many changes happening. Climate change is one of them, but it's this mixture of changes that gives us a lot of challenge. Okay, so like many places, there is climate change. Uh, there's globalization, urbanization. The world is getting smaller. Out migration that I talked about, but also changes in technology that do make a difference. Uh, especially, you'll see later in how these communities manage systems. But I think the real point is that all these changes also uh, opportunities, opportunities to innovate, right, to build resilience, and in a sense use that to bounce forward to make improvements when we're looking forward. I think that's why resilience is so important concept because we are living in such a rapidly changing world. Now, as mentioned, the opportunity in mountains is not necessarily the rice and wheat, it's the high-valued products and getting that to the market. This is a high-valued product. It's called Yarzagompa, and it's a, a, a caterpillar fungus. The fungus actually parasitizes a moth caterpillar. And the interesting part, according to Wikipedia, it has all kinds of different uses, right? Anti-aging, hypoglycemic, uh, anti-cancer, and an aphrodisiac. Don't you want that? <laughs> okay. So if you go to China, in this, this photo, you can see the picture of Yarza Gompa on the shop sign. And I took this picture in Kunming at the hotel I stayed at. That was 7,800 yuan for that packet. And that works out to about 145 euros per one of those little pieces of Yarza Gompa. Wow. By the way, you can get it cheaper online at Alibaba. I found that out doing research for this as well, in case you're interested. <laughs> but now we go to where does that come from? It actually comes from very high mountain areas, about three to 4,000 meters. And people are climbing, really climbing, looking for that little fungus that grows out of the, out of the earth. So what happens is, and you can imagine this is like a gold rush, people trying to get, there's tremendous amount of conflict over this resource. There's also a huge amount of environmental <coughs> degradation in the area. So what do they get? About two to four euros per piece. That's a big difference. Somebody's making some money in there. You can get it cheaper, and I'm sure for good quality, they get a little bit more. So. Bhutan, a wonderful country, has actually dealt with this in some ways. Uh, in early 2000, they said, nope, no harvesting of Yarsagompa. Basically, the Tibetans would come across the border and harvest and sell in China. And uh, Isimo had actually did a study of sustainable harvesting and suggested that there was a way to harvest this in a good manner. Why don't you open the doors and let the Bhutanese people take the benefit. So in 2008, there was actually legislation to do this. And uh, Bhutan set up an auction where farmers could auction and sell those goods and get a relatively better price. But it did take a long time to get this. But there is an opportunity now also to share knowledge between the different countries. All of that region has this Yarsagompa and to figure out how best to that the producers could benefit from, from this situation. Now, the second vignette I wanted to show is about springs, right? So what's happening across the Himalayas in the mid-hills are springs are drying up. Now, that could be climate change, but I don't think so. I think it's more, more people using more water, but it's also a technology change. People are switching to pipes and pumps. And actually, that technology is breaking down that social organization that's used to protect and manage these spring sources. The springs also are important not just for water supply, for drinking, for agriculture, but they also have in this region uh, a very cultural significance. So in Kathmandu Valley, traditionally, there was a very sophisticated uh, spring system that would serve people's uh, needs in the region. So the idea is, could we revive those springs? Could we take advantage of the strong communities that are in the mountain regions? And there are two big questions to do that. Where does the water come from and where does it go? That's a hard technical question. But probably the important question is who gets the water and, 
and, uh, and, and how much do they get. Now, the, I wanted to switch a little bit and talk about climate change. This is uh, Mount Everest and uh, a wonderful glacier, Rongbuk Glacier in front of Mount Everest. This taken in 1921. This is a photo taken in 2008. I'll do that again. Keep your eye on one place and you can see the tremendous retreat and shrinkage <coughs> of that glacier. What's happening, I believe, is that basically mountain people are paying the price of climate change. <coughs> this is another photo. Uh, this is taken from a glacier in Gilgit Baltistan, Pasu Glacier. What's interesting is this is the canal system, very ingenious canal system that connects to the glacier. Now when the glacier retreated, it shrunk and went down, and so that canal does not connect to the glacier any longer. So what people are forced to do is build the canal up higher. You can actually see in Pakistan those canals along the sides of the hills trying to tap into the glaciers. So what's, uh, it becomes a point when adaptation with this system gets too difficult, too expensive, even for the most resilient uh, mountain communities. We're trying to get solar pumps to see if we can lift up water in this region. So I had a question in this area, and they said, how do we stop the glaciers from melting? How do we stop the glaciers from melting? The thing is, there's probably nothing those local people can do to stop the glaciers. It's us. It's me taking airplane trips and <laughs> over to, as in my job, I feel guilty about this. There are steps on adaptation that people can take. Here's a wonderful example of, uh, from Ladakh, Choyan Norfell, making artificial glaciers, right? Diverting water to a shady place letting it freeze, then using that water in April and May as an adaptation strategy. Now, also in the region, there's a lot more hazard from flood events, from more intense rainfall and droughts. So this is, uh, it's, Assam is very susceptible to flash floods. In the, this region, to help build adaptation, uh, a technology working again with that community knowledge, community institutions, is a, the technology is a simple gadget that when the water level rises, an alarm goes off to this woman's house and basically tells everybody to run to higher ground, take your animals and run. What's interesting too is she has phone numbers here of all the villages nearby telling them to run and also in there is a phone number of the army come help, right? So it's not the central government figuring out there's a, a flood, it's actually this woman telling. Well, actually, what we're doing now is trying to uh, build networks of these community-managed systems to send the money back to the government. So there is strength in these community organizations to build on. Now, Michael, in fact, asked me to reflect a little bit on fair uses of resource. And so one is, that uh, th what we try to do is get the benefits shared between differently positioned resource users. And that position can be upstream and downstream. Remember the first story of the plains wanting the resources of the mountains? The second is the positioning over power of decisions, right? Who's making those decisions? Is it the wealthy versus the poor or women versus men in this region? And then it's uh, fairness and the ability to benefit. Certainly people who are more educated can benefit easier than less in many cases, or those people who have access to pumps and pipes uh, can benefit more. Um, by the way, I believe there's uh, a role in creating solidarity in the mountain countries to deal with these issues of the, of the plains, to deal with upstream and downstream issues in this world. And the, the point I did want to make as a wish for solidarity is that the world could equitably share the costs of climate change in mountain areas and really help people adapt and build resilience. 
I wanted to make just a few points about research. One, of course, is you know, you have to be able to understand who's winning and who's lo losing in these games, even though it's technology. But there is definitely a role for transdisciplinary research. But I think that research can also be very much an actor in this, right? So there is a role that researchers can use their knowledge to empower communities, right? So you're actually in the game doing this kind of research. There's another role for research to bring countries and communities together. In our region, we have Pakistan, India, China, Afghanistan, Bangladesh. These are kind of difficult countries to work together. But what we have found is this research over something like climate change is actually a way where we can bring countries together to discuss and to find uh, solutions and perhaps to take a step into solidarity and peace building in the region. With that, I'd like to thank you very much. This is uh, a, um, one of the fields in Pakistan, wonderful orchard that's fed by glaciers. We don't want to see that disappear either. Thank you all so much.